hi guys welcome back to another video if you're new here my name is Denisha and I am currently an LPN student and I have been an LPN student since May of this year and so far I am learning a lot and things are going really good in today's video I just want to touch bases with you guys and make a little short video on what to expect during your med surge clinical rotation now for my school, my clinical rotation for this semester is med surge and mental health. So I have recently been doing my med surge clinicals and I've learned a lot along the way. So basically what we do is, is we have to meet our instructors there at our clinical site at around 6.15, but we must be in the door by 6.30 or we get counted absent and we have to do that clinical again. Now, if we have to retake a clinical, we have to pay a $100 fee. Girl, I ain't got that type of money, so you know I'm there all the time on time. Yeah, I know what y'all thinking, like $100 really? Yeah, really, they are not playing. But anywho, that's another story. So, what I want to talk about is kind of what we do or what we have done so far during med surge clinicals. And this may not apply to all schools. I am talking about what is going on with my class, my LPN class and my school and what we've done so far. So in fundamentals, we learned a lot of basic things, mainly CNA stuff and some LPN stuff, but we learned a lot of things that helps prepare for our med surge rotation. So we learned things like medication administration, uh, Foley catheters, uh, bed baths, nasogastric, tu uh, nasogastric tubes. Um, I mean, and it was a lot more that I just really can't think of off the top because we had to do um, skills, a new skill every week. Um, and maybe I can try to find my folder and kind of show you guys towards the end of the video. Um, like a list of skills that we did and that we had to pass in order to move on to the next semester. So yeah, um, so far, um, like I said, we have to meet up by like 6.15 in the morning. Uh, at that time, you are assigned a nurse to shadow throughout the day. And usually uh, your charge nurse who's over that facility, they will assign you a nurse to work with throughout the day or something like that. So I was um, given my nurse and we get a packet. And inside that packet, we have a lot of paperwork to fill out. And when I say a lot, I'm gonna show you guys here in a little bit exactly how big the paper is, or not paper, but how big that packet is that I'm talking about. And inside that packet, you have like a list of things that you have to do. You have to list like uh, lab values versus abnormal lab values. Um, you must list um, the medications that your patient is on who you're who you're given because with the nurse as well your nurse should assign you one patient that you get to assess and uh, work with throughout the day however you get to check on other people too don't think that you're just limited to that one patient because I got to check on multiple patients and see multiple diagnoses and multiple other things that was going on and we also had a few students that was assigned to the OR so that they can see certain surgeries which I get to go to the OR next week which I'm so excited about I love trying to see what different procedures there are anywho that's a different video as well <laughs> so um, what we do is we follow our patient and what we do first is our head to toe assessment and we have to do a full head to toe assessment, listening to lung sounds, listening to heart sounds, checking apical pulses and checking your, your brachial and your femoral pulses, things like that. Um, making sure your patient is not in pain, that they're not allergic to anything and you know, just overall checking to make sure that everything is fine. Do they look normal? Do they sound normal? Do they look like they are in pain? When you touch them, do it hurt? You know, things like that. So you must complete your first, your full head to toe assessment. And from there you go into the system with they'll, they let us go into the system. They put us under student accounts. Therefore with our patient, we got a chance to see 
what they were admitted for, what's their admitting diagnosis, what uh, do they have any secondary illnesses that we need to know about, like what could be causing them to be admitted today, is it something, another underlying issue. Also, we got a chance to look at their lab results because most of the time they'll come in with blood tests, urine tests, things like that. And you just want to check for what's normal versus what's abnormal, which is why we have to write down those lab values so that you can know what could be going on with your patient. So after doing all that, we had to look at their vital signs because you must record and document that every so often, probably usually like every two hours. And if you have time, you can do it less than that. But you must always go back and check on your patient and you must always document what's going on with your patient when you when, when you go in. Normally, I used to, I usually ask them what's their pain level on a scale from one to 10 because you wanna know if your patient is in any pain so that you can tell their doctor, their nurse, or whatever you need to do so that they can get the proper medication um, order for them so that you can, you know, be able to take care of them, make sure that they feel better, right? So up on doing all that, you must document. Like I said, if you document it, it happened. If you don't document it, it never happened. And you need to always be able to cover your behind in any incident that you may be snitched on or that somebody may want to try to sue you or the hospital or anything, if you document everything that you do, you should have no issues and you can always go back and be like, hey, I know for sure I gave them this or I know for sure that they said that they felt like this and I documented it that I told the doctor or, you know, just anything. I'm just throwing examples out there. So documenting was a big, um, a big thing for us. Um, in that packet, we had a plan of care form, we had an abnormal assessment form, and a few other forms that we had to fill out, which, like I said, I will show you guys toward the end of the video because, I mean, it was just so much that there's just no way I can remember it off the top of my head to tell you guys, like, what to expect in that packet. So... Um, like that, like I was saying though, uh, make sure you document everything. And I'm going to say that a lot because like it's serious business, um, plan of cares. Okay. So most people say that LPNs don't really create plan of cares or do plan of cares. However, we are learning how to do plan of cares because it's really important to do a plan of care because you want your patient to be able to leave the facility, um, and have something in order for them to get well or to continue their care at home or just anything before they get discharged. You just want to have a set goal that's realistic and that's measurable so that your patient can heal properly and be able to go home feeling a lot better. Or at least that's the goal, to help your patient get home and feeling a lot better. So you must do your plan of care. And what a plan of care is, is just basically planning out something that you and your patient can do together or that the patient and the family can do together or something that we can do within that hospital setting that is going to uh, help alleviate your symptoms or your signs and symptoms or just to help you get well all together. So, yes, we do do plan of cares. At least our class have been doing plan of cares and I'm very grateful to learn how to do them. It is time consuming and sometimes it's a little hard to do. Um, and it might be because we're just starting off, which they said it will be hard, but it will get better. So that's one thing I'm looking forward to doing is getting a little more thorough on that. And I will also show you guys uh, uh, an example plan of care uh, at the end of this video. Um, so yeah, what I did with uh, my nurse is I got a chance to follow her. We made rounds. The first thing we did was vital signs. And then at around 9 a.m., which most hospitals starts um, doing meds at around 9 a.m., their first med pass, we would go to the EMAR. Um, sorry for you guys who don't know what EMAR is. That's their uh, medication administration record. Um, so you just go to the EMAR, look up what medications they have, and you take it to this system which my nurse had to put in like some ID numbers and use her thumbprint because they are using thumbprints to get into the system, which I think is really neat because then you have no choice but to take responsibilities for your actions in case you mess up or 
uh, in case you may lose a medication or for opioids like yes some nurses do drugs so you might take that pill or lick the fentanyl pouch i don't know people do weird stuff I mean, doctors, lawyers, I mean, everybody do weird stuff. So I'm not going to say it's limited to just a certain people or a certain career field or whatever. I wouldn't want a nurse doing drugs, especially taking care of me, but it happens. Just keeping it real. So, yeah, I think that's neat that they use uh, thumbprints to get into the system to keep up with what's going on, who's in the system, things like that. So, um, there's rules to medication administration. You must check everything like three times. So, she did that correctly. She let me pop out meds. She let me scan some meds. And um, we got a chance to do that. Um, also, I got a chance to do a few injections for some uh, diabetic patients. So, that was cool. One of my classmates actually did get a chance to do a Foley catheter. I did not, however. I wasn't lucky this time. But I am looking forward to doing one on somebody. I mean, I just want to get the, you know, the experience. Because we did them on mannequins. And doing stuff on mannequins is not the same as doing them on humans. I'm sorry, but it's just not. So I'm just going to warn you guys now, if you think you're going to go and do your skills on a mannequin and you're doing good, it's not going to be the same because my my uh, classmate and my instructor was literally getting beat up while trying to do a Foley catheter on this patient, which I can understand why. They're uncomfortable, completely uncomfortable and probably painful. So yeah, no, I totally get it. Um, trying to think of anything else that we did that was significant. Um... I really can't think of anything off the top of my head. Just like I said, this is supposed to be just a quick little rundown of what you may expect. And it's basically all the things that you've learned in your fundamental skill lab. Everything that you've learned, you can put into practice during your med search clinicals. And you're just learning the basics on how to be a good nurse. Making sure you perform hand hygiene. Making sure you're greeting your patient. Making sure you're asking for two identifiers, like may I have your name, date of birth. You wanna make sure your patient is alert and oriented. You know, you wanna make sure that they're not in any pain. Always ask them their pain level. Always ask them are they allergic to anything because you do not wanna to touch them with latex. If they are allergic to latex, you don't wanna give them the the wrong medication or say if you're cleaning them and they're allergic to shellfish well you don't want to use iodine so you always 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 ask their pain level always ask for their allergies and always ask for name date of birth because you want to make sure you're giving the right medication to the right patient or that the right patient is going through the right procedure and things like that so that is pretty much it that is pretty much the basics and it is what it is so i'm gonna get ready to show you guys these packets and then we'll go ahead and just see what else i may have to throw in there but for now let's just go ahead and let me show you guys exactly what i was talking about with the med surge packets and paperwork okay so here is an example of all the things that we had to learn and do during first semester of fundamentals. This is a list of all the skills we had to learn. And like I said, we had to learn a new one each week. So we started out with hand washing in sterile field, um, which was pretty nerve wracking because you have to make sure that you never ever break your sterile field or you must start over. The second one we had was uh, PPE, bathing and uh, bed making. You have to know how to uh, put on your personal protective equipment and take it off in the right order because there is a certain order that you do it in and vital signs. So if the power ever goes out, you're going to absolutely have to use your stethoscope and um, your blood pressure cuff and do all your vital signs by yourself. There's no machine that's going to help you. So, of course, that is a very important skill to learn. And you have your nasogastric tube, you have your enema and ostomy care, sterile dressing change, which you have to maintain your sterile field, um, trach cleaning care, Foley exertion, and last but not least, your head to toe assessment. Now, what we had to do is we had three attempts to do it. Well, actually two attempts. 
If you failed your first attempt, you had to do it again. If you do it a second time and say you failed it, then you had to um, get remediation. If you failed it a third time, any of those skills, you were pretty much put out the program. So as you can see, these are really important skills to learn. This is all for fundamentals. And this is all the stuff that we got a chance to do during our med surge round, okay? Let's get into the next one. Okay, this is what we call a CPE, or a Clinical Performance Evaluation seat Sheet. I covered up uh, the top portion because it does have my school name on there. And of course, you know, we try not to um, tell what school we're at for HIPAA reasons and just for protection. You know, people are nosy. They might try to come blow my school up. Who knows? But um, what the CPE is, is it's our evaluation form that we use to evaluate how well we did our skills. And we also use these still now for our med surge. So right here, you have what semester you're in, your clinical site, clinical instructor, and your weekly goal. You get graded on professionalism, communication, your critical thinking, the technology used, and all that other stuff. You must get a satisfactory on them in order to uh, continue on to the next semester. If you get an NI, you must be able to redo it with no issues. Like I said, you have two attempts to do it. If you fail it a third time, you will be kicked out the program. Um, so yeah, this is uh, what our instructors use to grade us on. And that's pretty cut and dry for you guys, right? Let's go to the next one. Okay, this form right here is our critical, our critical thinking worksheet. I don't know if any other uh, programs do this, but our school is making us do these. And what this is, is that we obtain all the information that we can about our patient, um, and we try to put all their uh, diagnosis and all their medical problems um, in these boxes and we tell how we found out that they had it what were their abnormal lab values what medications um, do you think goes with that um, diagnosis and what your major what your major concern and issues are and the information that we write on these papers we put them in the top order from the most um, critical I'd say the most important um, diagnoses and what we can do for that plan of care. So whatever you think is the most important, which usually is your Maslow's, and you will learn a lot about that during your fundamentals. So normally your airway, breathing, circulations, or what we would call ABCs, would be the most important thing you would start at, and then you can work your way down from there. So this helps determine what your plan of care is gonna be and how you're going to uh, help your client better themselves with that plan of care. Okay, last but not least, this is this huge package that I was talking about. As you can see, it's stapled right there. It's pretty thick. Um, what this is, is it's just telling us what to expect uh, for our weekly clinical paperwork. Um, we have to fill out everything. It says our medication section should, should, uh, should include all scheduled medications. Um, and like I said, this whole packet has to be filled out every week. We also have a documentation thing and a reflective journal to let them know what we felt like toward the end, what we learned. Um, we have to have all of the documentation completed. And here's the grades that we have in order to pass or move on to the next semester. We must have a satisfactory on each packet or we will basically, that means we're not progressing and we probably won't be good nurses. You want to make sure that you're always satisfactory. Um, if you want to go above and beyond, they said they have one that's a little higher, which is not on this packet. Um, so yeah, that is the first page and what it looks like. Okay, first page on this one is your patient information. This is where you get the majority of the things about your patient, their allergies, what their age is, what their 
what they might prefer religious wise what is their code status are they do not resuscitate are they full code um what's their height and weight are they overweight body mass index uh what are they admitted for why are they here what do you think you can do to treat that diagnosis what is the pathophysiology of it like how is it formed what can you do to um treat that uh diagnosis are they isolated do they have any precautions what's their secondary my uh secondary medical diagnosis say if somebody comes in with a wound and it's not healing is it because they're diabetic like what can go there uh do they have coronary artery disease like what is it that they're going through at that time so that's pretty much what this form is okay on this page you have their lab values intake and output throughout the day if they are intaking water ice chips iv fluids whatever they might be intaking you want to write that down whatever they're outputting especially urine bowel movements how many have they had what is the color of the the urine what is the color of the bowel movements is the consistency normal um how many times are they going is that normal is that abnormal vital signs like i said you have your time and days, and then you have to look at the trends. Uh, is, your, is your client improving? Is the vital signs getting better? Are they getting worse? What do you think is contributing to the improvement? Do you think it's the medication if they're in pain? Do you think it's uh, breathing treatments if they have COPD or uh, asthma or anything like that? That's pretty much what this form is, and cut and dry, correct? All right. Okay. Lab values. This is what they want us to write down and fill in all of these boxes. There is more on the next page where that came from. I'm not going to go through all that. I just wanted to let you guys see exactly what it looked like. So you would put like your white blood cells. What was the patient's result when they had their test done? What is the normal range? If it's abnormal for your patient, what's the possible cause? Say like the white blood count level was above the norm. What could be the possible cause? Is it infection? I mean, what's the signs and symptoms that you see associated with it? And what can you do to possibly treat it? So that's pretty much what this form is saying. Like what is the abnormal values? What values did your patient have? Okay, you guys, I told you it was a lot of paperwork. <laughs> We're only halfway through it. So on this page right here, you have your medications. Anything that your patient is on, you want to write down in this box right here. All the medications. Now, one of the patients I had had like 15 different medications. So you best believe I had to write all those medications down, what their generic and trade name was, my patient's dose versus the average dose. Um, what's the route, frequency, and time that my patient is getting it? When was the last time that they had it? Um, I need to know my classifications, uh, whether it's pharmac well, the pharmacological or the therapeutic. Like it can be an antipsychotic or an antiarrhythmic, something like that. The action of the drug, the major side effects, and my assessments prior. Like, what do I need to check before I give the medication? Do I need to check vital signs? What do I need to check? Do I need to check apical pulse? Do I need to check the potassium levels? What do I need to check before giving that medication? And what can I teach them about that medication? Are you at risk for a fall? Um, will you be drowsy? You know, things like that and of that nature. So that's basically what we had to do here. And it goes all the way down. This form right here is just... Uh, fall risk form and it's just basically answering questions about the patient do they have a history of falling do they have a secondary diagnosis are they uh, walking fine do they need assistance do they use a walker crutches, crutches or like a chair um, if they have IV access check their normal gait and their mental status and you just add them all up and you can uh, make a fall uh I can't even say it right, a fall prevention action for your patient. Pretty simple. Okay, you guys know I've said this throughout the video all day. Document, document, document. 
I cannot stress enough how important documentation is. Like I said, if you do not document it, it did not happen. You must always be able to save your own behind in case anything happens. So you'll date and time it right here. And we use military time and you'll write exactly what is going on with your patient or say you're doing your head to toe assessment. You want to write all that information about what was normal or abnormal about your patient. And you want to sign and date Make sure you leave no spaces because somebody can come in and write in between the lines and write a nurse's note and it's signed under you and then you're stuck with it. So that's one thing right there is document. Document, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Document. Okay, last piece of paper that I want to show you guys is what I was talking about for a plan of care. This is an example and as you can see at the bottom it says use Maslow's hierarchy of needs with emphasis on the ABCs of your client assessment, meaning you must prioritize the most important thing you think your client needs help taking care of first in order to get well. So you have your problem and that's say, say my person was in for pneumonia. The evidence that he has pneumonia, well, if I did vital signs and did my head to toe assessment, I would bend and heard crackles probably inside of their lungs. Or you can have a chest x-ray done. So that would be your evidence. What is your goal? Like, what do you want them to do or accomplish before, their, uh, before they leave the hospital, before the end of hospitalization? Like, what is your goal? So right here, you put your nursing interventions and things like that. So say like if my patient had a wound infection, since I used that earlier, what would be one of your nursing interventions? Well, I would definitely want my, um, my nurses and the doctors to maintain aseptic technique when cleaning and caring for that, for that wound because you don't want any further ex infection. Or I might say that I want my client to eat a nutritious meal high in protein and vitamin C to help heal wound or you know something to that nature and the rationale behind it why would you want them to do that what's so good about aseptic technique what's so good about protein and vitamin C so you want to tell why and that's the reason why I said plan of cares are kind of hard in its own little way because you have to Put the problem, the evidence that it's there, what you're trying to accomplish by the end of their hospital stay, and then you want to give three nursing interventions. What can you do to help that patient heal or get better or feel better and why? So it's basically what, what can you do, and why are you doing it, if that makes sense. So you must always work from the highest priority using Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you move on down. And usually you have three problems. However, since we're second semester students, they are making us do two problems, which makes it a little easier for us. But at the same time, since we're new to this, we're still trying to learn and get it all together. So yeah, that is the last paper. If you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to press the subscribe button. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. Thank you for tuning in and I'll catch you on the next one.